dim. Those are for Kaddish at the end. That's for Kaddish at the end. So, okay. Okay. Adonai Natan Vadonai Lakach Yihishem Adonai Mevorach God has given and God has taken away. Praised be the name of God. We come here this afternoon to remember your loved one, your friend, your neighbor, Bella, to celebrate her life, to remember the things that were good and true and faithful in her nature, and to say something about the story of the way that her life progressed. Our tradition teaches that we look to our ancient texts to find comfort and solace. In the words of Psalm 16, we read, Shiviti Adonai Lenegdi Tamid Kimimini Bal Emot. Lachen Samach Libi Viagel Kevodi Af Bisari Ishkon Lavetach. I have set the eternal always before me. God is at my side. I shall not be moved. Therefore does my heart exult and my soul rejoice. My being is secure. For you will not abandon me in death nor let your faithful ones see destruction. You show me the path of life. Your presence brings fullness of joy. Enduring happiness is your gift. As we remember Bella's life, we read the words of Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the mountains, what is the source of my help? My help comes from God, maker of heaven and earth. God will guard you from all harm. God will guard your soul, your going and coming, now and forever. And in the words of Ecclesiastes, for everything there is a season, for every experience, a time, a time to be born and a time to die time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. I'd like to invite Bella's husband Dan to come forward and talk about her life. We are gathering here to mourn the passing of our beloved Bella, but at the same time we want to celebrate her life and accomplishment. And what a life it was. She survived the Holocaust, lived in four countries and three continents. We live in this country for more than 40 years However, I was not able to lose my Romanian accent. So please bear with me while listening. Bella was a truly wonderful person. Her biggest quality were a very warm personality and a deep knowledge of common sense. The story says that once a man came late to a memorial service for his friend Knowing his friend and hearing only words of praise, he starts wondering if he didn't enter the wrong room. But today, if you will hear only good things about Bella, they are all true. True, her na true to her name, Bella was a lovely, beautiful lady that everybody loved. She was admired and respected by all her friends, and she never had any quarrel or fight with anybody in her whole life. She was devoted, a devoted wife and mother, and was admired to everybody for serenity and charm. She started her life in 1934 in a small village named Perzereshti that had a population of only about 1,500. 
The village is close to the city of Kishinev in what it was then called Bessarabia, a province of Romania. Bessarabia is a land between the river Prut and Dniester and was ruled by many land, uh, many countries during the years. Today, the land is independent with the name of Republic of Moldova. She was born Bela Kozer in a Jewish family of farmers. Her father, Avrum Kozer, has a very small farm with a plum orchard and a vineyard. Her mother, Malka, help working the fields. She has an older sister, Leah, and two older brothers, Shai and Joina. She remember only glimpses of her early childhood, like the fact that her duty was to gather twigs and small branches to start the fire that will dry the plums from their orchard. Their quiet life came to an end in 1939 when Bessarabia was falsely ceded to the Soviet Union and the communist government came to power. In 1939, the Germans started war against the Russian. The Russian retreated, and Bella Sitter and her husband retreated with her and settled someplace in Russia. The Germans started killing and moving Jews into camp and ghettos, and many Romanians participate in this atrocity. Bella was six or seven when the local police came and arrested her father and her two brothers, and they never came back. After a few days, her mother was also called by the police. Before leaving, her mother washed Bella's hair and asked her to remain with one of the neighbors, and she also never came back. This neighbor found a family without children who took her in. They changed her name to Lenuza and took her with them to the local church. The lady of the house was a kind woman, but her husband was mean and liked to drink in excess. When he was drunk, he started screaming at his wife to remove the Jewish girl from his house. It appears that eventually he called the local police to report a Jewish girl and two soldiers came and removed her when, when she was working in a field. The soldier took her by train and moved into a Jewish ghetto in the city of Tiraspol in Ukraine in what was then called Transnistria. The ghetto was originally constructed to hold a hundred people, but at the end, more than 800 were living there in a cramped condition. She was taken care by a young couple and started working at the hair dressing salon, but she was only about nine and she could not hold the curling iron steady, so she was moved to help a seamstress. The tide of war changed in 1944 with the return of the Russian army. In March of 1944, many orphans and children were evacuated from the ghettos of Transnistria and moved into an orphanage in the town of Yashi in Romania. There she was found by Dr. Isidor Moscovich, who was looking for his niece, who had the same last name as Bella. He found Bella instead, took her home, 
and together with his wife Rosa, they decided on the spot to adopt her. They have a son, Zigu, who was a few years older and who was very surprised to come home from school and find a sister. They didn't make any legal adoption paper. Instead, they created a birth certificate for her as their daughter and randomly selected the birthday of January 15, 1934. They also changed the spelling of her name by adding the double L in her name. A short time afterwards, with the Russian army approaching, they decided to leave Yashi and settle in Bucharest, the capital of Romania. Bella's adoptive parents were very nice and provided all what she needed. She was always a good and respected child and was never in any kind of trouble. When she was about 10, she started going to school for the first time in her life. She did not know to, how to read and write, but was placed directly in second grade. After her first school year with some tutoring at home, she jumped a few classes and finally entered a class with a girl her own age. She graduated from professional high school and started working as a laboratory technician. Her adoptive parents were not religious but kept some of the Jewish tradition and holidays and did not like assimilation with other religions. They hoped that she will find a nice Jewish boy as her partner in life and their wish come true. Every love story has a special beginning. Some of her friends organized a party and they needed a portable record player, so invited Bella who had one. There she met a young Jewish student, Ben Kalistrat, me, and it was love at first sight. After a courtship of five years, during the time I got my engineering degree, got a job, and found a place to live, we got married, and last year we celebrated 54 happy years together. Bella also has a pleasant surprise. She received a letter from her lost sister. It was the first contact between them in 18 years. The sister came back to live in their old village that belonged at, the, at that time to the Soviet Union. After many years, the sister found from a distant relative who lived in Siberia that Bella is alive. Bella went to visit her, and it was a great reunion. The visit happened only a few weeks before we got married, and my friend asked me if I would worry that she would not come back to me. But I was sure about our love, and she returned as promised. We left Romania in 1963 and emigrated to Israel. At that time, the Romanian government didn't allow people to leave the country, especially persons with advanced degrees. But unofficially, they were greedy for hard currency, and you have somebody in the West that has money to pay for you, they let some people go. My mother-in-law, Rosa, has a brother living in Italy, who paid $4,500 for me and Bella. We learned how much we were worth in a way similar to the slave were sold. In Israel, Bella started working in the laboratory of an ammunition factory. It was satisfactory work, but the environment was dangerous 
being prone to bad accidents. She stopped working when she had, we had our first daughter, Mona. During her pregnancy, Bella has some tense days when she was alone and I was in the six day war. After a year and a half, our second daughter, Ruth, joined the family. In 1970, we decided to try living in America and settle in Randallstown, Maryland. We bought our first house and Bella changed it into a lovely home. She kept it immaculate and even when we could afford to hire cleaning help, she refused. For a while, she balanced our checkbook and she did not want to use a calculator. She wanted to exercise her mind by doing manual addition and subtraction. She liked to walk and almost every day she went about two miles to a nearby supermarket, even if her car was in front of the house. She was a very cautious driver, and in 40 years, she never had any accident or traffic tickets. Only once she got a warning for turning right on red at a location where the warning sign was installed the same day she was driving and the policeman was in place to warn people about the new restriction. She developed a close relationship with my mother, who became a third mother to her, and also with her sister-in-law, Irina and Caroline, who were more than friends to her. They were like sisters she never had when growing up. We are happy to see our girls grow, become successful, and establish their own family. We are also blessed with two granddaughters, Rachel and Debbie, who are filling our life with joy and laughter. Many people ask us about the secret of our long marriage without any problems of quarrels. The first thing that I can think of was that we have different personalities. Bella let me take most of our decision and I try to consider what she liked. Sometimes I have to pursue her to do things. For instance, she was reluctant to travel long distances and was difficult to convince her to go to China. But in the end, she loved that vacation very much. Another important thing in our marriage was having mutual respect for each other. Bella was also a mod modest person. On our shopping trips, I was the one trying to convince her to buy things or clothes for her. And most of the time she refused saying that she had enough at home. I was really a lucky husband. <laughs> the only thing that she liked to buy were nice towels and tablecloths. I was left with a huge collection of them. A little more than two years ago, Bella has a stroke from which she only partially recovered. She lost her appetite, but slowly regained it, and with the help of Jewish penicillin, chicken soup brought weekly by our dear friend Otilia. She was stable until one year later when she found out that she has ovarian cancer. She tried to fight it with special treatment, but at the end she lost her body. The family would like to thank the friends that were very helpful during the last two years by visiting, bringing food, and providing needed support. As I 
mentioned before, Bella was an outstanding person. She will be remembered as a great wife, mother, and grandmother. Zikronola Bracha. Now I'd like to invite forward Mona, Bella, and Dan's daughter. Thanks everyone for coming. Even on webcast, we have Texas and Israel, and I'm not sure who else. Thank you. Um, just tell you about my mom. To start with, I was thinking about the book, The Life of Pi, and in there, Pi compares his mother to the son. And I just remembered this line so clearly from the book because it's so simple and true. To a child, a mother is a son. She gives life and light. Even on cloudy days, you always know the sun is still there, just like a mother is always there behind you and ready to come out. Everyone here knew my mom and dad. Ruth and I grew up in a stable, traditional home. My mother stayed home to take care of her family. She was always there for us after school and to take care of us. I remember all the classic mother-daughter moments. I remember her dragging me and Ruth to meet the other kids in the neighborhood because we were too shy to do it by ourselves. I remember her teaching me to bake a strawberry cake that I wanted after I had one at my best friend's house. I remember she always said yes to sleepovers and parties. I remember her taking me shopping for a dress for a dance. I remember her planning, helping me plan my wedding. And I remember her face the first time that she held Rachel and then she held Abby. I don't really remember the times when we were really young and how she played with me and Ruth. I'm sure she did, but I just don't remember her doing, sitting down on the floor and playing with us. But I remember how she played with my girls when they were babies. When they were babies and they couldn't complain, she liked dressing them up with different hats on. We would take a picture, she'd try a hat and take another picture. She'd sit on the floor with them and she'd play games with them. They liked counting money together. She didn't like it when the girls would spin around and try to get dizzy, even though I told her that's what they were trying to do, is trying to get dizzy. Her post, most important lesson to me was that she taught me how to be a mom, and I hope to be a great one like she was. We never have enough time with the ones we love. I'm trying to remember what a great life she had, even though it wasn't long enough. My dad, Ruth, and I started going through my, mom thing, my mom's things. The most fun part was her purses. She had a lot of purses. And we started checking them and found money in every single one. And it wasn't change. It was mostly $20 bills in every purse. So we took the money, and we went out to eat a few times. And then we divided up the rest and gave it to Rachel and Abby. And that's from Bella. My dad really impressed everyone after my mom had her stroke. He took care of her and the house. He's been a rock. He doesn't complain, but he does what needs to be done. He continues to teach me lessons on life, even when he isn't trying. He's amazing. Sean said what he likes to remember the most about Bella is how she laughed. Sean is a funny guy, and sometimes he could really get my mom to laugh, like throw her head back and really, really laugh. And that's what we like to remember. Abby said that one of her favorite moments and memories of, is walking to the pond near our house with Bella and feeding the ducks with her. Rachel's favorite story about my mom is when the girls were really young, and we used to tell this story that Rachel threw a ball and accidentally hit Abby with the ball. So then Abby started crying, but Rachel started crying even louder than Abby started crying because she was upset that she'd hurt Abby. And my mom likes to tell that story. It was one of her favorite stories about the girls. Thank you to everyone for all of your support. We've had some great emails and notes from all, some of my friends who remembered my mom. I've had all sorts of support from my family and friends. It's great to have so much love to fill in a little hole of my heart. I'd like to share some of the notes and memories that we got from our friends and family who were so thoughtful, and these will really be treasured. For example, 
Bella was loved and respected by everyone in the Romanian group. She was quiet, smart, and very kind. When she called me, she used to, she used to say, Ce mai faci scumpo? We all loved her. Your father was by her side 24 hours, seven days a week. When we suggested he go out and play bridge once a week and we'll stay with Bella, he would not hear of it. I respect him even more now for the devotion that he had for your mother after she got sick. We're going to miss Bella. May she rest in peace. Another one we got is she was the nicest, sweetest, and most caring woman. We should all be like her. From someone else. I remember always Bella with big rosy cheeks and a warm loving smile. She was sweet and always kind to me. From someone else. I remember her feeding me when I met her at your house in Baltimore. I wasn't hungry, but that didn't matter. She made sure I ate. And another one. She touched our lives in her quiet, loving, and caring ways. We finally remember the numerous family events, holidays, festivities, and Thanksgiving dinners. Bella was always a gracious hostess, welcoming everyone warmly and making us feel at home. During dinner parties, it was a pleasure having quiet chat with Bella and seeing the sparkle in her eyes when she spoke about her granddaughters. In her gentle and soft-spoken manner, she demonstrated her humbleness and selflessness, always putting others first. And one note I got from Israel, we will keep Bella in our hearts as an example of a great soul with modesty and finesse. We have memories that we will never forget. All her life, my mom was a very caring and gentle person. She will be missed, but she will be remembered. Thanks again for sharing this sad time with us and these memories with us. And Bella's daughter, Ruth. Hello, everyone. Hello, those watching online. There's a camera, so uh, Texas, Israel. Thank you all for coming, although my mom would be mad that you went out of your way for her. She'd say, Donala, why do you let everyone come out? It's cold. It's Tuesday. People have places to be, things to do. You know how she was. She was always worried about others. If she was walking down the street and she saw a coin on the ground, she'd say, let's leave it for a kid to find and make them happy. When death takes your mother, it steals that word forever. But I want to talk about my mother. After all, sharing tales of those we've lost is how we keep from really losing them. Someone once said, they say such nice things about people at their funeral that it makes me sad to realize I'm going to miss mine by a couple days. You've heard from my dad about her early life. It was hard being a young girl, separated from her family, alone and scared. But she grew up into such a caring and trusted person. She was never bitter. She never complained. She never felt sorry for herself. Well, I started feeling sorry for myself. My mother's dead. I'm half an orphan. Then I thought about my mother. She was an orphan at eight years old. At least I got to spend 43 years with her. I should be grateful. When I think about the future, I feel content because I know my mother wasn't happy with her situation. But I feel sad about the past when I think about all the happy memories, such as I remember fun trop shopping trips together. And if I didn't need a shirt, but she, we saw a cute one, she'd say, oh, just buy it. Uh, for herself, she loved flowers and those shirts that look like two shirts, but they're really only one shirt. So she liked to buy those. She liked bright colors, so she wouldn't be happy to see me in black today. I remember her delicious spinach pie. I remember her volunteering at a carnival at my school, and she had the job where she had to take care of the goldfish bowl, you know, where you throw the ping pong ball, and she had to scoop out the fish and give it to the winner, and one time a fish died, and she had to get a new fish. And I remember wanting a pet, so we adopted a cat who had five kittens. I don't think she bargained for that. And then we wanted a dog, so we got Frisbee. After Frisbee died, we wanted another dog, so we got Max. She never complained about having to help take care of them. Once I bought a small lizard that ate live flies and worms, but she drew the line at that one. She never complained about taking care of us. For me, it was commonplace to come home from school, and she would be there with a snack to find out about my day. She would cook dinner every night. 
but when it came time to do the dishes, I suddenly had something important to do. I hope I said thank you, but I was probably too self-absorbed. But like I said, she never complained. She was an excellent lis listener. Most people like to talk about themselves, but not her. She liked to listen to other people. I think it was hard for her. She spoke with an accent, and strangers would often ask her, where are you from? Even if she lived in this country 40 years, people would still ask, where are you from? But she was always polite to strangers. She was proud of her Romanian heritage and also being an American. She always started to compliment people. For instance, once my parents got new carpet, and not only did she serve lunch to the carpet layer, she told him that she thought he had an interesting job. My mom was always worried about our safety. She'd say, wear a scarf, don't drive at night, close your mouth when you walk down the street. Do you want a fly to go in your mouth? What am I, a lizard? With the grandkids, she was worried, but she didn't want to criticize them. So she'd tell me, Ruth, I don't like Rachel and Abby playing so close to that table. She tried to leave things nicer than when she found them. For instance, in a store, if she saw something on the ground, she'd pick it up. If she borrowed a Tupperware, she'd return it filled with food. When I returned home from a vacation, not only did my parents watch our dog, but my mom would always have a few plastic bags of food that we would take home, thereby saving me a shopping trip and giving me some food for a few days. I saw how devoted my parents were to each other. When my father was in the hospital a few years ago, she stayed by his side for an entire week. And then when my mom had her stroke and cancer, my father cared for her in an amazing way. He took care of everything, the house, the bills, the laundry, her doctor's appointments, the medicine. He would walk up and down with her down the hallway to help her exercise. He was always positive, tried to make her happy. And I like what Mona said as he continues to teach me lessons on life even when he isn't trying. One thing that gave my mom pleasure with ha was having a leg massage, and I can't tell you how many hours of leg massages my father gave to her. My mom and I both liked to listen to the Dr. Laura show, which is a talk show where people would call up, a radio talk show where people would call up asking for advice. So I'd say, let's listen to Dr. Laura so we can see that other people have problems too. So when I made my weekly visit, I'd bring an MP3 player and We'd go to the bedroom, I would play the show, massage her legs while she lay down. Sometimes after each caller, I'd pause the show and we'd talk about what we heard. It's a simple, quiet thing we did together, but now more than ever, I cherish the time that we spent together. So how do you say goodbye to an angel? Well, when someone's in your heart, they're never truly gone. They can come back to you and even at unlikely times. I don't know what happens when we die, but I'd like to imagine her reuniting with her family, being happy eating chocolate, and not gaining weight. <laughs> Thank you. And family friend, Julius Schneidman. My sister Caroline met Bella when they were young girls going to school together in Romania. Their friendship lasted a lifetime and they became not only friends but sister-in-law. Caroline lives in Houston and uh, is not able to be here today, but she wrote a letter and asked me to read it on her behalf. Before I read that letter, I would like to express my heartfelt sorrow from both myself and Erika to Dan, Mona, and Ruth. We have immense admiration for the way they lovingly took care of Bella. She was our friend and our relative, and it was our good fortune to have known her for 60 years. Bella was always happy, and she made people around her happy. She was stoic in how she coped with her, the fate of heavy burdens through illness, and her strength and perseverance was remarkable. We will always remember her fondly and keep her memory alive in our mind and in our hearts. We will miss her. And now here is a letter from my sister Caroline. Dear Bella, how I wish that you could hear me and what I have to say. 
This is Caroline, your friend and sister-in-law. I say friend first because, as you remember, we have known each other since middle school. We continue our friendship and even became sister-in-law. I was lucky to meet you. For those of you who did not meet Bella, you missed a lot. I have always admired you for your sweet personality, for your calm nature, and always ready to give wise advice. I was hoping that your health problem would improve so we could share more happy events together. Unfortunately, it did not happen. I was disappointed, disappointed that I could not be there next to you for moral support. But, oh my God, how did you find such a terrific husband to love you so much? I have rarely seen such devotion. You were the luckiest woman in the world. You do not find a man like this every day. You have a beautiful family, and I'm going to look over your girls, Mona and Ruth, is like my own. I will miss you and I love you. Caroline. We take a moment for silent reflection as we prepare to recite the memorial prayer. Please rise. El male rachamim shochen bam romim, am tsei menucha nechona tachat kanfea shechina, im kiroshim u teorim kezohar harakia, mazirim et nishmat, Bela, Bat, Avrum, Vimalka, Isador, Verosa, Shahalachal Olama, Baal Harachamim, Yastireha, Besetek, Knafav, Leolamim, Vitror, Bitror, Achaim, et Nishmata, Adonai, Huna, Chalata, Vitanuach, Bishalom, Al Mishkava, Vinomar, Amen. God, full of compassion, you dwell in the heights and in the depths. Grant perfect rest under the wings of your presence to Bella Calistrat, our loved one who has entered eternity. Let her soul find refuge forever in the shadow of your wings. Let her soul be bound up in the bond of eternal life. For you, the everlasting God, are her inheritance. May she rest in peace. And let us say, Amen. Please be seated. The words of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We invite now Bella's mourners, her father, her daughters, to rise first for the mourner's cottage. And as is the custom at Baltimore Hebrew, we invite those who wish to stand with them to do so now in sacred community. Bagala, Uvisman, Karivim, Amen. Yehesh me Rabba, Mivorach, 
לעולם עולמי עלמיה יתברך וישתבח ויתנשא ויתהדר ויתעלה ויתעלה שמי דקודשה בריחו לעילה כל ברכתה ושירתה תושבחתה ונחמתה דם ירן במה ואמרו אמן יהא שלמה על שמיה וחיים עלינו ועל כל ישראל ואמרו אמן עושה שלום במרומיו הוא יעשה שלום ועל כל ישראל ואמרו אמן I ask you who are gathered here to repeat these words after me, speaking them to the mourners. May God console you with all who mourn in Zion and Jerusalem. Hamakom yinachem etchem betoch sha'ar av le'tzion v'yerushalayim. Now we pray go forth in peace, in life. Amen. This concludes our service. Sure, everyone can follow through the hallway to uh, the room where the family will gather and there will be refreshments.